Thank you very much, and uh, thank you for the chance to <clears throat> have a chance to share some thoughts with this, this group after such an interesting morning. I'm going to change pace a little bit, and I'm going to talk about the food system uh, this afternoon and how we get all of these uh, foods and so forth that uh, we've been talking about. And so um, I'm, I'm talking from the point of view of the fact that I uh, chaired a committee in the last couple of years which looked at the social, uh, environmental, economics, and health aspects of the U.S. food system. And we were to develop a framework to be able to assess those aspects of the U.S. food system. And um, I want to go back. Our committee report, our committee reported in, in January in 2015, and we have in this, uh, in this report a description of what the U.S. food system is and how it got to be uh, what it is, its evolution. But we have chapters in the food system about the effects of the food system on health and on the environment and on uh, social and economic issues that uh, face our food production situation. And so I'm going to briefly go through some of those, those issues. <clears throat> this uh, slide shows uh, a conceptual model of the food system and the food system as a supply chain. And the point about this is that it reaches from agriculture to the consumer, but between agriculture and the consumer, there's an awful lot of things that go on. And uh, within that uh, framework, there are a lot of feedbacks and, uh, and uh, uh, pathways that influence each other. And one of the things that came out of our, our deliberations was that when you have a policy in place that deal with the food system, you can't look at just one thing. It has an effect upon a whole lot of things within the food system as, as you look at, at the interconnections that, uh, that are there. And I'll give you some examples of that a little bit later. We've talked about the health outcomes and the health situation about foods this morning, so I won't spend a lot of time on that, only to the point of view that, that the food system in this country provides a food environment in which these health issues flourish. And so we are looking at not particular one individual crop or one individual food, but we're looking at the food system that is involved in how these uh, health issues have come about, particularly those of chronic disease uh, that we were talking about this morning. Associated with that, of course, are things like foodborne illnesses and, uh, and some of the pollutants that get into our food supply. The environmental effects, uh, the effects that uh, uh, affect uh, the sustainability, there are a whole lot of these that are involved with our food system. Soil and water use is a very big term, but we have uh, the way in which we're treating our soils and the way which we're using our water supplies today is a big issue environmentally in the food system. And nitrogen pollution, we produce, we use so much nitrogen to produce uh, grains in this country that uh, that we have a dead zone in the Gulf of Mexico because of the nitrogen running off farmlands down the Mississippi and causing algae growth uh, in the, and uh, using up all the oxygen at the Gulf of of, uh, of Mexico. And the same thing has happened, of course, in Lake Erie. We've got uh, algae blooms that have made it difficult for the water supply there. Uh, Des Moines, Iowa has had to put in a, a, a very special denitrification water supply for their water supplies because of the nitrogen use that we have in our food supply. Pesticide pollution, um, we're using herbicides uh, at an enormous rate. Uh, we're not entirely sure that we're not doing an ecological experiment in that regard, and that's an issue. Um, ecological balance, the monocropping, uh, changes the ecology of our rural areas uh, to an extraordinary extent, and that's an environmental influence. And then greenhouse gases, uh, uh, which I'll spend a little bit more time on, uh, uh, affecting climate change. So there are a lot of environmental issues that are involved with our food system. <clears throat> but there are also a lot of social and economic effects of our food system that are important, I think. There is, uh, even though we have a, a food supply that is probably the cheapest in terms of our disposable income in this country and the world, there are segments of our population that are somewhat left out. Uh, 
and so there's food security for a segment of our population. Healthcare access to farm workers. I'm going to say more about farm workers and farm labor issues but, uh, that, that are involved with uh, immigration safety. Farm uh, labor is one of the most dangerous occupations in this country in terms of accidents and so forth. Uh, farm wages uh, and, and wages in the food system in general are about the lowest in our economy. Uh, so those are important issues. <clears throat> Independent decision making. Um, 80 percent or probably 75 or so percent of our poultry are raised under the direction of four companies in this country who actually provide the the details as to how the, they are to be raised. The individual farmers are not making individual decisions. It's, uh, it's, uh, it's, it's, so a lot of the farm uh, activity is uh, lost its independent decision making and the concentration of agriculture has emptied out a good share of rural America so it's had a major effect upon rural development. So there are many of these social and economic effects that are in our food system. Let me just say something more about farm labor. About two million self-employed operators and family members are in farm labors. There's about a million who are not uh, family farm workers. And about 60 to 80 percent of those, as I say here, are employed on crop farms. Most are foreign born and more than half are undocumented. They're unauthorized to work in the U.S. So the issues about immigration and undocumented workers in the food system, uh, particularly when it comes to crops and fruits and vegetables, is a major is a major issue. Now there have been a number of policies that we point out in this report that have been intended to affect the food system, but have implications beyond the original intent. A good example of this is biofuels. We have a, a mandate to put ethanol in our fuel. Uh, that's caused 40% of our current corn crop uh, to go into biofuels. That's caused farms to plant corn wall to wall. And in areas of the country where corn really shouldn't be grown, we're using the aquifers underneath uh, uh, Kansas and, uh, and uh, Nebraska and Oklahoma uh, beyond the ways in which they can readily be replenished. That's, a, a, a un, I think, an unexpected outcome of that particular policy, or one at least wasn't thought of. Our fertilizer use, uh, I've mentioned, and I'll talk a bit about dietary recommendations when we make recommendations for so much fish consumption or fruit and vegetable consumption. I'll say something about those in a minute. But also the use of antibiotics uh, has uh, resulted in uh, uh, resistant organisms. Again, uh, a policy in place that had unanticipated un, uh, results. And even the uh, California initiative to get rid of uh, caged chickens and had head housing practices has had some un, uh, unanticipated effects in terms of the farm workers and in terms of uh, perhaps contamination of eggs and so forth. So that uh, there are policies, uh, part of the things about our report was that if you're going to look at a policy, you need to look at it in all of its dimensions. Look at it in terms of environment, look at it in terms of health, look at it in terms of, uh, of the social and environmental impact to really really have a look at what it's all, all about. Um, some issues with fish, uh, the dietary guidelines are recommended eight ounces a week. Uh, only about 70% of our population eat fish. Uh, the current consumption is a little lower than half of that recommendation. And the current levels of wild capture are at maximum levels for practically most species. So the sustainability of our fish supplies in the oceans are a major issue. And farming is not necessarily the solution because farm seafood brings lots of other environmental issues, uh, uh, including uh, a further use of our wild supplies. So those are some issues about fish consumption that I think we need to think about as we talk about that recommendation. Fruit and vegetable consumption, again, current consumption is about half of the current uh, recommendations. Uh, one of the things, if we increased our fruit and vegetable supply in this country, uh, about 75 percent of the production is uh, irrigated land. Uh, we'd have to change where we get some of those if we were going to greatly increase our consumption. We have the issues of labor markets and immigration that are important in those crops. 
And of course, we'll probably end up with a lot more imports in, in that area. Now, the sources of greenhouse gases uh, in the US, uh, uh, agriculture is supposed to provide about 9% of the greenhouse gases. And a portion of that, maybe close to half, it comes from uh, 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 methane uh, uh, coming from ruminant animals. A lot of the rest of it comes from nitrogen fertilization, where ammonia and nitrogen nitrogen compounds are go into the air. But if you look at the food system in general, the estimates are about a third of our greenhouse gases can be a, a, attributed to the food system. When you put into the case the production of fertilizer, the, the production of packaging, the transportation, and all of those things that go with it. Um, this just shows something that we've talked about, that beef cattle have by far the highest uh, greenhouse gas emissions. Uh, dairy cattle are somewhat uh, less and uh, the other uh, animals are, are, are considerably less than that. I had an opportunity uh, this year to, to be involved with a, with a group in Europe uh, who was looking at the economics of ecosystems and biodiversity. This is a group in Europe that is trying to, is looking ahead and saying if economic development in the world continues at its pace and people behave the way they usually do, which is try to increase meat consumption, uh, along with economic development, uh, what are the uh, costs of that going to be and where, where, where are we going to have to deal with, how we're going to have to deal with that. So they have actually done um, uh, uh, a look at the natural capital cost of these things and they define natural capital in this way uh, and they put into that natural capital greenhouse gas emissions, air pollutants, water consumption, water pollutants, soil pollutants, and land use change. And they've tried to look at the consumption uh, of all of those uh, natural capital used in live product, livestock production, palm oil, rice, inland fisheries, corn, and these are studies underway. The livestock one will be published, uh, I think, probably about the first of the year. But what they show is that the total natural capital cost of uh, beef, dairy, and poultry production worldwide is given a number, I mean, how, how we can actually, uh, uh, how much faith we can put in the actual number uh, is probably difficult, but the actual proportion that you can see here is, is uh, probably quite realistic and is consistent with what we talked about earlier this morning, and that is beef production has a very high capital cost. Part of it is because of the land area that it takes, and, uh, and if we're going to increase beef production uh, to meet the 2050 needs uh, of these expanding uh, populations, uh, it'll take a lot more land. Um, greenhouse gases are also a, a piece of that. Milk production and poultry meat production are somewhat less. The average capital intensity, this is the amount of capital intensity, this is the amount of capital per kilogram of protein, shows the same thing. Surprisingly, dairy is less, but it's because the dairy is producing milk and particularly in modern dairies, produces it at pretty high yields, uh, given that they're keeping the animal in place. Poultry meat production is less, and the people at this meeting I was at say, well, in 2050, we'll all be eating chicken, and uh, <clears throat> if we're eating meat at all. Uh, so yes, my, my, my point is it's still legitimate to consider environmental issues and making dietary recommendations. I think. This is part of the food system. Dietary recommendations are one part of our food system, and the production and all the intermediate steps are also part of the food system. And, and I think we need to ask ourselves, are there other social and economic issues and trade-offs that should be considered? Because we've talked about greenhouse gases and, and lowering red meat production, but are there some of these other issues that affect food consumption that we should consider in dietary recommendations? And, let me just mention here the Dietary Guidelines Committee report had a very modest discussion about environmental impact. They said that we'd be better off if we ate we're lower in animal-based foods that are more health-promoting and are associated with lesser environmental in impact in terms of greenhouse gases, energy, land, and water use. Uh, it's not going to be an easy thing to get that done because this was a letter signed by 29 senators to the Secretary of Agriculture that basically says you better not try that uh, over our dead body. So um, I think there's a real challenge in terms of, of connecting the food system to 
uh, our dietary recommendations, and there's also a challenge in connecting a strategy to make these dietary recommendations coincide with our food system and with the regulatory system under which we operate. So thank you very much. Uh, well, first off, uh, I want to thank Sarah and Phil uh, and, and Walter, David, for giving me the chance to participate in this really extraordinary gathering uh, of people and this uh, exchange of ideas. As somebody who has uh, worked in the field of sustainability for 25 years, I cannot uh, underscore enough how important finding common ground is. Uh, and it's not just something that you do after you've figured out the problem. It's something you have to do all along the way. It's part of the practice and art of sustainability, regardless of the issue that we're dealing with, in this case, food. But it's about the process of genuine dialogue and building the trust that really enables collective action based on common ground. So it's, it's really fundamental and important. So kudos uh, to all of you for putting this uh, together. So um, I'm going to talk, uh, Mal and I worked this out beautifully ahead of time. Uh, that he was going to give that very clear uh, and sobering overview and that I was going to focus in uh, on a more place-based example, uh, the New England Food Vision. Um, and I'll get to that in just a second, a regional uh, example. So first, a word about sustainability. Uh, I'm in my 19th year at the University of New Hampshire running a sustainability program university-wide. And the framework uh, that we use, and therefore that is reflected in the work I do related to food systems, is what's pictured here. And that really derives from um, a synthesis of the international frameworks and agreements and policy studies uh, and the like, really looking at sustainability, which is a kind of health and integrity of all these systems simultaneously, climate and energy, biodiversity and ecosystems, food systems, and culture. And the point in, in the context of this conversation is from this point of view, you cannot have sustainability if you do not have a sustainable food system. But by the same token, you cannot have a sustainable food system if you don't have the larger frame of sustainability. We need uh, a, a climate that's not uh, erratic uh, beyond the point of our ability to adapt. We need healthy functioning ecosystems. And thank you, old ways. Culture, culture, culture. It's been mentioned in a myriad of ways here already this morning. It's so much at the heart of these issues. Uh, it's not just about consumer choice. It's about underlying identities, values, norms, institutions, and the like. So culture is really at the heart uh, of sustainability. Um, one other thing I want to say here, you'll see maybe around the outside, I don't know how clear it is, curriculum operations, research, and engagement. Those are functional areas in the context of the university that we work on. But the point here that I want to make more generally is that sustainability has broad general principles, underlying ethical obligations, but it doesn't come to life until it's brought down to the ground in a particular place, with particular people, in a particular time. So in that sense, it needs to be part of the rhythms of day-to-day -day life and worked into our institutions and our identities and our practices. Um, and so that's a big part of it. And so we could say in some ways it's a place-based uh, concept. So let me just quickly, is, that's what I have left? Yes. Okay. I thought, boy, that wasn't that long a story. Um, so place-based, perspective on place. Uh, in the cosmos is what the astronomer Carl Sagan had in mind when he suggested that the Voyager in 1990 turn around just before leaving into deep space from almost four billion miles away to take a picture of the Earth. And it's one of the most amazing images. Uh, I don't know if you can see it over to the right side in that red vertical, but that little pale blue dot, as he called it, is us. That's home. That's everything that's ever happened in human history. Here's another shot of us from 2006, the Cassini uh, spacecraft. And if you look at about mm, like 10 or 11 o'clock, just outside the brightest white ring of the mighty gas giant Saturn, you see the pale blue dot. 
So that's us. So talk about some perspective that might push us to find common ground. This is one of them. We're floating out there in the middle of this, and really all we have are one another. Uh, here we're going to zoom in on New England a little bit. This is, uh, if you look off uh, the coast of Florida and the Carolinas, is Superstorm Sandy, um, gaining more strength and about to head up the coast uh, to visit New York and New Jersey and to open up a whole new level of awareness about climate change, climate vulnerability. Here's, of course, uh, North America, a miraculous landscape capable of sustaining very diverse uh, food systems, but one in which a, a industrial food system of enormous strength uh, has really taken hold, and it really underscores both the power and the limits of science and technology. And it also underscores the challenges of democracy. And a big part of, of what I would argue sustainability has to say about these conversations, it's not enough to vote with your fork. You need political agency and you need to operate as a citizen as well as an eater. That's my stump speech. So zooming in on New England. So New England has its own rich history of food and farming. Um, that has a lot of local attributes to it. Prior to the European settlement, corn, beans, squash, foraging, hunting, fishing. In the 17th and 18th century, uh, really was an agrarian society focused on household subsistence. Uh, a, a more or less sustainable system was at work. Uh, and then in the 19th century, of course, everything changed. Industrialization, urbanization, the commercialization of agriculture. And there's a cautionary tale in New England because the trees were cleared at a reckless rate uh, with very inefficient agriculture. It damaged the waterways. Uh, and eventually that, that quelled because agriculture concentrated and then migrated away. Uh, and then the forests uh, slowly came back. But in the final uh, 50 years prior to where we are now, New England really, in a way, allowed agriculture to uh, contract. We've lost a lot of agricultural land and a lot of agricultural enterprises. We've allowed our fisheries to come in an extremely dangerous state. Uh, and we've allowed ourselves to be at the tail end of a very long pipeline that does not serve New England uh, very well right now, nor will it necessarily in the future. So let's take just a little flyover of this, uh, this New England region. I just want to give a couple of attributes uh, just to really reinforce what Mal was saying about the multidimensional nature of the food system. So here's one way to do this, and this is my own take on sort of layers, so you'll bear with me here, I hope. But geologic provinces is one way to uh, proxy soils. And the big story of soils in New England is glacial till. And when you combine that uh, glacial till with our climate, uh, then you have the perfect makings for pasture. It's really made for pasture, which supports livestock and supports uh, orchards. Uh, this I know is probably very difficult to see, but it's just to remind us that there's been now a uh, evolution of the landscape where development, sprawl, and the like has become the single biggest uh, consumer of farmland. And it's, it's a major issue. And so farmland has really uh, reduced down to just 5% of the landscape in New England, 2 million acres. That's only 5%. So we've really marginalized uh, agriculture in a major way. Another thing to call out here is when we think of a New England food vision of this six-state region, it's interesting that more or less there's kind of an inverse relationship between northern New England, which has roughly 25% of the population and 75% of the land, with southern New England, which has roughly the inverse, about 75% of the population and only 25% of the land. So urban markets, major uh, urban concentrated areas, and big, uh, smaller uh, density, lighter density, wide open spaces. As a region, we can fit together uh, quite well. Uh, of course, obesity, uh, I don't know if this is showing up, but just uh, rates of between nearly 25 and 30 and 214 uh, all across the region. If we include the number of overweight adults combined with percentages for the region, we're nearly at 62% overweight. 
overweight and obese, about 7 million adults impacted. Uh, this is household prevalence of food insecurity and very low insecurity, or in blue. Uh, and of course, the very important contributor to all of this is poverty, shown here in red, which is the uh, percent uh, of population. As elsewhere, I'm not going to disaggregate it here, race matters. The numbers are much worse and much higher for people of color in New England. Okay. So with this in mind, uh, a group of people got together, not unlike this gathering, to ask what can we do better together as a region than as separate states, uh, as separate communities. And that began uh, a process where we were asking how can we take the exploding demand for local food, which is happening in this region as well as elsewhere, uh, and really make it a driver of health and well-being and equity how can we take, notwithstanding this exploding demand for food, the challenges facing many small-scale farmers and fishermen who are farming and fishing in the red? There's major structural problems with the, with the food economy that is making it very difficult to be profitable, even though there's this demand and passion uh, to get on the land and on the sea. Um, how do we then, at the same time, weave that together with inequality, hunger, food insecurity, obesity, and as I already called out, um, including and particularly those that uh, are in the most vulnerable state, which uh, too often aligns with race. So two currents of work really come together here to arrive at this vision. One was a convening to look for common ground, very much like this, uh, that began in 2010, and we've had a series of food summits, New England food summits, uh, that started in 2011. And, and what's the goal? To transform New England's food system together to make it a food system that is a driver, a resilient driver of healthy food, sustainable farming and fishing, and thriving communities. Uh, and then you see under there six states, one region, again, working across smaller scale individual interests and the New England food vision. So the New England food vision, healthy food for all, sustainable farming and fishing, thriving communities. The healthy food for all is really a core value having to do with both food as a human right which while officially the U.S. does not subscribe to, um, it is one that the, this network that's working to make these changes does subscribe to, as we also subscribe to racial equity and food justice as a core operating value of what we do. So sometimes the tattoo, if we end up getting one, will be 50 by 60, um, and that's been a rallying cry. And I should say, one of the, the things that has been so interesting about it is it's just a vision but yet it has opened up a space where it's legitimate to aspire to a robust regional food system future. New England takes a lot of knocks when it comes to agriculture, uh, as in you shouldn't do it, right? It belongs elsewhere where it's easier. Uh, but now it's okay, and one of the, one of the examples uh, that really strikes me is a colleague of mine who works in uh, farmland protection said, this vision has shifted the conversation from how can we slow farmland protection to how can we triple it? Because that's what the vision calls for, a tripling of land in agriculture while maintaining 70% forest cover. But I get ahead of myself, but I'm running out of time. So for this crowd, I thought this would be of interest because these are three diets that form scenarios to look out 50 years to 2060. So the current diet is the business as usual uh, diet, uh, the omnivore's delight, uh, is, the, is the middle one, and that's really a combination of the USDA My Plate and the Harvard School of Public Health Healthy Eating Plate. Um, and then the one on the right, Regional Reliance, is really a scenario that says, what if there's major disruptions in this supply line and pipeline that we have, and what, do we have to, what if we have to provide more, more than 50%? So that's called the re Regional Reliance. Uh, the things to call out that I think pick up on some of the themes earlier, uh, the omnivore's delight is roughly a doubling of vegetables um, and then tripling or quadrupling fruit, uh, whole grains, reducing refined grains, increasing protein-rich plants. Uh, having, or no, red meat is, is reduced by two-thirds and pork by 50 uh, percent. Uh, and dairy is at 1.5 cups, so it's between the one and two that the Harvard uh, a plate uh, called for. And then if you move to the right into the regional reliance, 
we end up with um, just more plant protein um, for, uh, for the protein piece. What this envisions then is that we would actually be returning to the amount of land in farm, farming that we had in 1945. So it's not as if it is unprecedented, but it's a return to 15% of the landscape uh, engaged in producing food and cultivation. And that, again, honors a 70% forest cover goal that has been set out in terms of preserving our forests for the ecosystem services that they provide. Uh, so where does that get us? This is just a scenario as it was put out. With six million acres, we could grow all of our vegetables on a half a million acres, half of our fruit, uh, the cold fruit, obviously, all of our dairy and beef, mostly on grass um, and pasture, all of our pastured pork, poultry, and eggs, but even though they're on pasture, that requires um, uh, imported feed grain, and that would leave about half a million acres for some portion of the grain, people and animals, grain for uh, uh, artisanal baking, uh, uh, beer making, that sort of thing. We also need a strong yield from our fisheries, and our fisheries are in very uh, difficult uh, shape, but there's a lot of family fishermen that are struggling on the water, and the food system as a community needs to fully incorporate fisheries into our work and into our concerns. So I see I'm, I'm almost done. done. Almost done. So, so what I want to what I want to say is uh, is here just to, to go back to where we started about finding common ground. So this is the long wind up here. So. This is an image of network, um, uh, network thinking, or one image of it, that says we keep investing in building connectivity, trust, relationships, familiarity with one another, and then we start to align around aspirations and values and vision. And if we invest in that work the way we're doing here with these two days, then our concerted action can really be, be crystallized in a very efficient and effective way. But we can't start from scratch when we don't know each other, we don't trust each other, and I'm speaking here across the whole food system. I'd love to give examples, but I don't have time. So I already said transforming the food system. This is just some images of a subgroup. We've convened um, uh, probably 600 or 800 people over the last four years in annual food summits. Uh, but this is a network team that is from all parts of New England, all parts of the food system, that's been meeting intensively uh, to uh, develop a whole uh, plan. I want to say in our commitment to racial equity and food justice, who participates in this matters. And we have been working uh, very hard, but still have a ways to go to really get the representation that we're looking for. And we have three fantastic ambassadors in the southern three New England states who we support so that they can go out into their communities and communities of color in the southern part of the region and engage in conversations about what people's hopes and dreams are around the food system and what their challenges are and, like, and the like. So final slide. We just completed a systems mapping exercise for this network. It was all very technical and, and lots of diagrams and arrows and feedback loops and everything else. And we spent three days interpreting this to say, what are we going to focus on as a network? And so one of the top things is democratic empowerment. Again, not just consumer empowerment, but democratic empowerment so that people really have agency uh, in terms of the food system for all the reasons that Mal talked about. There's lots of policy that we need more than just consumers for. Uh, sustainable economies to really commit to economies that serve the public good serve ecological health, household health, a good life, and the like. And finally, a new narrative, and this is where I see this work here plugging in in a really powerful way. What comes out of this uh, common ground can feed into this new narrative that we'll be looking to, to push out, and really it's out there, but it isn't linked together, to really open up these possibilities and say we can uh, transform our food system if we intelligently work together. So thank you very, very much. Um, well, when Sarah first uh, mentioned this panel, um, my reaction was, you know, Sarah, is it trying to reach a consensus on healthful eating enough? Isn't that going to be enough? Why do you have to, you know, throw this on top, <laughs> which was, I think, a kinder and gentler way of saying, you know, what, the, what our legislators um, 
wrote, <laughs> which was, you know, doesn't this go beyond the, aren't we going beyond our purview here? Is it? And so I'm going to put it to you, you know, both of you. What, what does this have to do, sustainability have to do, with a conversation about diet? Uh, well, I would say everything, um, and uh, to separate it, uh, perhaps there's reasons to separate it, to focus in on something for some particular reason, but you're lifting it out of its relations and its context, and it, that's why we end up with unintended consequences. So as I said in, in my framework there of sustainability, if we don't have all of the integrated values that we're talking about, being systematically moved forward and, and cultivated, then we're going to fall short. So it's it's not a choice as far as as I view it. Yeah, oh, I, would, I would agree with that. I mean, we can't. I don't think we can make dietary recommendations without looking at where that food is going to come from. And uh, I, we'd like to be successful in our dietary recommendations, so people would follow them and do what we tell them to do. But there are situations, I like to use the seafood example, where there's not enough fish in the sea right now to take care of everybody following the directions that we give them in total. And so, but there are other examples I'm sure that we could come up with that say, we're gonna say we should do something, let's make sure that it kind of comes in with the food system in a way that makes it possible for that to happen. Yeah, just, just to append this thought, I'm, I'm good, I'm mic'd up all day. <laughs> for better or worse. Um, I, I was at a, a conference not too long ago. We were talking about community health promotion. And, and one of the speakers, I, I thought, very wisely pointed out as we discussed individual behavior change, that the choices any of us makes are subordinate to the choices all of us have. And, and you know, that argues in terms of behavior change for the social ecological perspective. But, but I think it's directly relevant to a dialogue about diet and health. And, and to make it vivid, I, my thinking has gone in two directions. One, if we're talking about optimal eating, but we don't care whether or not it's sustainable, we're talking about optimal eating for the current generation at the expense of the next. And for most of us, that means our children and grandchildren. So you know, I don't think that's very comfortable. But the other thing is that, you know, I think what's different now, you know, the choices we have now, and therefore the choices we have to make are different from the choices that we might have made when there were only 100 million of us on the planet, right? And so it's like the difference between you're on the Titanic, it's lavishly provisioned, nobody's thinking about rationing the food. Then an iceberg rips the thing open, everybody's overboard into lifeboats, and all of a sudden, you know, as it turns out, the rescue was quick. But if you were thinking, all right, how long are we going to survive in these lifeboats? Rationing would have been absolutely critical to the thinking because circumstances have changed. I, you know, I think we've sort of gone from Earth as the Titanic to Earth as a lifeboat at this point, right? Mm -hmm. I, I, you know, and, and it's, I wanted to flip the question around, and that is, what can those of us whose principal focus is public health, health promotion, disease prevention, what can we most contribute to advance the agenda of those of you who are coming at this from the environmental side? Well, you know, one of the things I'm often asked is, how do we connect public health and agriculture? Because here you've got, on that food system diagram I showed you, you've got agriculture way over on this end, and you've got consumers and public health way over on this end. And, and the, I think the way you connect public health and agriculture is not so much between those two extremes. What goes on in the middle? There's a huge amount of issues going on with the food industry, and how that agriculture production is translated into what it is we're eating and the products that are available and how they're advertised to us and all of that sort of thing. So I think, I think the common ground between public health and, and consumption has got to kind of come in that area as much as it is between what the farmer is actually doing. Because the agriculture is actually a part of what I like to call a bioeconomy. And the bioeconomy produces food, but it also produces fiber, and it produces fuel, and it produces a lot of other things. And so the food system is essentially competing with that. Right. So I like to see this middle ground as the place where we have to kind of come together on that. Yeah, I would say that, uh, well, a couple of thoughts. One is, somebody mentioned the Anthropocene earlier, and it, it may be worth noting that that was uh, first actually brought up 
as the Anthropozoic era in uh, the late 1800s. Um, so people were already seeing that we had become a geologic force. Right. Um, and with that geologic force comes a whole new set of rules and roles. And we can no longer afford to act haphazardly and chaotically in terms of our collective impacts because we are a geologic force on the planet. So if we don't, I think there's a narrative in here that, that the, the, um, the MDs and public health still hold tremendous legitimacy in the public, as far as I know. I haven't heard anything otherwise. And for the medical community to be part of a broader coalition that's speaking with the same language and the same, the same voice, to say, we have got to make a transformation here because our vulnerability is rising. And if, if we ignore it, we're leaving it in the hands of people who are being guided by shorter term, right. narrower uh, demands and interests. So um, it's not a conspiracy in that sense, but we, we have got to break through these separate silos, to pardon the, the, the term for this content, <laughs> but really, and start to speak as a community around the future of our food. And, and Barry, I, I suspect you're probably on our team and we're just being a provocateur, but carry on, please. Not <laughs> a provocateur, right? Um, well, um, are there questions out here? Uh, yeah, I, I had one more, but we can come back to it at the okay, end. Sorry. Liz? Sure. So I Hang on a sec. I don't want to open up a whole new discussion, but it's sort of part of the discussion about the environment and sustainability. What about food waste? I mean, you know, I just saw a movie called Just Eat It, kind of like a Super Size Me type movie. It was great. You should watch it. But the number that's bantered around is that 40% of our food from for, uh, farm to fork is wasted. I think we need to be talking about this in a big way. And I'm just sort of curious how we're ever going to bring about significant change in that area. Just such a like monumental issue. Okay, food waste. Guys, go ahead and fix that, please. No, we'll, 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 queue, we'll queue up the next question while you tell us how you're going to do that. I mean, I couldn't, I could, oh, sorry, we, are we? No, I, no answer that question. No, we're just getting the microphone. Yeah, not that. fix it, but no, you're absolutely right. And, and, and to me, it's, um, it's, it's a startling symptom of a very broken and sick system uh, that really gets back to a food culture. Um, why would it become so normal? to waste so much food. Uh, it, it doesn't make sense ecologically. It doesn't make sense economically. Um, and it, it's, it's, it's just a part of a, a bigger broken system. So I think it's, it's important, but it's, it's one of many. Would, would, would regionalization help with that? Because yes. there'd be a greater sense of ownership exactly. of the whole supply chain? Greater yeah. transparency. I, mean, I, th I think also, I mean, Scarcity will probably be some uh, effects on this too. I mean, uh, we had a, one of the people who came to our, one of our workshops from this committee was uh, who was claiming that that looking at the food that we're going to have to have in 2050 to take care of our population, that we can take care of that by just reducing food waste, uh, and that's probably easier said than done because it happens because of various reasons. But nevertheless, I think it's an important. So I have a question about five years from now. So dietary guidelines aren't out yet, Frank, but thanks for getting uh, the sustainability on the counter. And a lot of us were thrilled to see 29,000 comments go in, way more than ever before. We're kind of licking our wounds thinking, well, it got more on the table than ever before. So that means in five years we'll be ready. I remember this conversation about the farm bill two farm bills ago. And then when that next farm bill came around, we were a whimpering group or something. I'm not sure what it was, but we, we didn't follow through five years later. Is there anybody with the political savvy in the room to say, we know they're against this. We know Burwell and Bill Sackerstein were coloring outside of the lines. Do you have to do something now and not five years from now to get it on the table for the next DGA? Dietary Absolutely. Guidelines Association. Absolutely, you, can, you can't wait a day. And I think we're already meeting with people about the next farm bill. And they're sending out marker bills, and they're floating different proposals in Congress. I mean, it's a whole world unto itself that I don't know that much about. Uh, but I think we have to start right away, and 29,000 isn't enough. We've got to build broader coalitions beyond expert communities. Uh, I think the broader public needs to recognize that we're shoulder to shoulder with them. 
uh, that this is something that affects us all long term. And the work of building coalitions is, uh, it's not sexy, but uh, you, you just got to do it. I, again, I would argue finding common ground at this level will then empower a lot of us to be able to broaden those coalitions. Yeah, I, I think that um, the public health community has a lot that they can do in this regard to get started on this. Because there are issues that we can point to that have been very successful. For example, well, I'll use, uh, where's, where's Walt here? I mean, we trans fats. Walt said to hell with this concept. Right. <laughs> <laughs> you know, some of the, we, we said they were, were bad. We got the, got the public health community to buy onto that. The public heard that noise and they said, I don't want anything that has trans fats in it. So they demanded change. So there's been change. So I think that if we could build a, a, a consensus as to what are the changes that we need in the food system and have it driven by the consumer side of things across the food chain, that we'll have some successes that'll make the political system respond in one way or another. And, and if I may just quickly, of course we have Frank and others from the DGAC in, in the room and Frank will be commenting shortly. But you know, one thing that occurs to me is uh, however much people still trust MDs, they sure as hell don't trust politicians. And the Dietary Guidelines Advisory Committee report, the, the report of the scientists, is in the public domain. I mean, everybody can share it and say, you know, the politicians are politicians. They're mucking around with it. But this is what the experts actually think. And so they planted the flag for sustainability, right? I mean, we, we can all get traction with that report, even if the politicians don't fully honor the spirit of it. Barry, I don't know if you have something else, but uh, David Jenkins had a question. No, I'm afraid not, not so much a question. Well, the question is, are we entering this game a little bit late? Um, I was just listening to the guy from Australia who was in charge of their, their environmental issues there, and he admitted that the Great Barrier Reef was uh, not going to be something he could take his children to see in the future. So, I mean, I think we're, we, 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 the, 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 the 11th hour is passed. We're having this meeting, thank God, but you know, it is, it is late. Um, do we have to take sort of draconian moves right now and then ask ourselves what, a, not, not what we like to eat, what we, what we enjoy eating, what is optimal for health, but at this particular point, do we have to say what is optimal for the planet that we could eat and then do some reverse engineering and say, are there any cultural uh, Mediterranean diet, etc., etc.? Are there elements of that which, we, which actually fit with what we can grow? and uh, what which we can do sustainably. And so look at it actually not from nutrition, should nutritionists be looking at it not from a nutritional point of view, but from the sustainability point of view at this point. Well, I, I think that uh, for me, I, and I don't know if this responds, uh, there are many late nights where I do think uh, the time has passed, but I'm a born optimist, so we've got to go out fighting. Um, but. I think in terms of the new narrative, one of the things that we need to switch is this question of how are we going to feed 9 billion people? Who is the we in that question? The question from a sustainability point of view is how are 9 billion people going to feed themselves? Right. And I think if we go down that path, then you see a much more decentralized system. You start building regional and localized, more diverse, more resilient, more adaptive. Uh, more in tune with the cultural heritage and other sorts of resources that pull. And f from my way of thinking, that's the best uh, hope. Uh, and it's that, that tension of aggregation to the global scale where if we homogenize everything, that's what the industrial system has, has done. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I think I'm going to go along with you on that. <laughs> so, so actually, so that, that's a nice toss to me with the clock ticking down. Uh, I don't know that we have time to discuss this, but I can kind of cue it up for, for corridor discussion. I thought, I, I'm hearing more and more uh, from groups like Food Tank and the Eat Forum in, in Europe about the true cost of food. Uh, those infographics show up more and more in popular press. So we've got a room full of journalists. Uh, you know, I think this issue of natural capital cost, yeah. I, you know, I think discussions between journalists and, and, um, and sources of expertise about what is the true cost of the food we eat because, and how do we get people to understand that? Uh, you, should, you should understand that this committee I was on grew out of a workshop that the FNB uh, Food and Nutrition Board held on the true cost of food. And so they all said, yes, we need to go into the true cost of food. So. Um, 
they said, okay, we'll do this committee to examine the true cost of food. Well, the Board on Agriculture was part of this and says, well, we're a little nervous about that. Let's put this committee together to do a framework as to how you study the true cost of food. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, so, so that's where we did. Now, our committee went a little bit further. We made these kind of tough chapters on what the effect of the food systems is. And uh, that, uh, that uh, got us a little bit of uh, feedback, but nevertheless, you're right. But there's an education to be had right. there and new, new right. metrics to talk about. I, you know, I love that natural capital right. cost. Right. All right, we are once again in the red zone. I know questions are unasked and unanswered, but uh, we've pretty much got a captive audience, so grab them when they're trying to get coffee. Thank you all very much. Thank you.